Thanks very much. And uh, I'm really glad to be following Penn because I'm white, old, male, a director, and I work for a organization that might have a bit of Deadwood in it. You never know. Anyway, um, so I've uh, I've come to talk to you about the 21st Century Challenges program. Um, what we're not doing in the 21st Century Challenges program is trying to work out how we can persuade and advise organizations to shape themselves around some of the provocations that we've heard this time. What we're trying to do is to make sure that there is an archaeology for us all to engage in, because without that, everything else falls away. So uh, the really critical part of, of uh, 21st century challenges is to make sure that fundamental existential threats to the operation of particularly development-led archaeology uh, are, can be seen off and seen off uh, um, robustly and sustainably into the future. Some of you will have heard of this, I'm sure. Some of you might have gone to the Society of Antiquaries Manifesto uh, uh, day. Um, others of you might have picked it up on, on media and so on. But uh, I'll give you a short uh, description of what it is. So it's a long-running programme of cross-sector activities designed to improve, ensure improvement in development-led archaeology. It's rooted way back in CIFA's own Southport, Southport report back in 2010, um, and it's based on uh, subsequent uh, quite wide sector uh, engagement, quite wide, several hundred people, but perhaps not as wide as uh, Michael would appreciate. Um, and then um, uh, uh, after the evidence gathering, uh, prioritisation, then COVID hit and uh, uh, Historic England was somewhat distracted uh, by having to run the Cultural Recovery Fund and, and various other things like that. And then um, uh, uh, we've, we've picked it up again, obviously, since uh, lockdown uh, uh, finished. It's co-chaired by both Historic England and CIFA, and that was our approach to try to make sure that that what representation is in there is not a government trying to tell a government agency trying to tell a sector how to run itself, but the government agency listening to the sector to try and get what is needed and what we can do with um, uh, what we can do to make uh, your lives better. And the principle about it is that. It's about getting tangible benefit. So something that you can actually feel, if we get it right, something will have changed for the better. Um, those are the, the people involved. I won't go through and, and list them, um, but they are possibly some of the organizations that Penn has picked out as saying, well, they might be representative, they might not. There is a real challenge, and I'll push back on Penn here and on Michael to say, how is it that you give an equal voice to 7,000 archeologists? How do we do that? when my job uh, involves, and Peter Hinton's job, involves so much else as well. How do we filter that information? We're very, very open to polyvocalism and, and listening, but I think there are some real technical and practical challenges in what is being proposed or, or, or offered up there as, as, as a, an issue to resolve. Uh, I'm not saying I won't listen. I'm saying I'd be really interested to know what the, the, the solution is. Um, there are five goals in... Uh, um, 21st century challenges. The first one, the really big one, enhance law and policy to improve sustainable manager of heritage assets. This is the bit where we go into uh, uh, make sure that the levelling up and regeneration bill has the right clauses in it to help heritage protection and to drive and maintain uh, uh, Valletta Convention, PBG 16, now National Planning, Planning Policy Framework kind of approaches, which is the, the source of all of, not all of, but 99% of the funding for archaeology in this country. £240 million pounds a year gets spent on, on development-led archaeology across the UK. It might be up, <coughs> excuse me, it might be up um, since um, uh, Landwood's research, uh, um, we're, we're obviously, we, that's a, a sequential cyclical uh, uh, survey. And the, the figures have gone up period, uh, regularly, uh, almost entirely apart from the blip in 2008. Um, goal two, oh sorry, I'll just go back one. So what we're trying to do there, sector voice on LERB, and, and this comes to Rob um, Lennox's piece on advocacy, which you'll hear about uh, uh, in another part of this conference, we're trying to make sure that um, uh, as, as far as is possible, the sector presents a united front so that we can act uh, in concert around some of the areas where we think there are problems and issues to be resolved. 
Um, and so the sector voice on the levelling up and regeneration bill, the advocacy framework are all things that will help um, uh, give voice to the 7,000 archaeologists wherever they are, whether they're in the museum sector, the academic sector, the charity sector or the commercial sector, or even the government sector. Goal two is improving the resources and resilience of local authority uh, archaeological uh, uh, um, advice services. Uh, we don't want to dismantle that. It's a great system. It works really well when it works. And we want to make sure that the local authority uh, staff who are um, at the front end, at the cutting edge of this, the, the sort of coalface, are as supported as they possibly can be. If we get statutory historic environment records through the levelling up and regeneration bill, if we get it, that will be an amazing uh, opportunity to, to uh, support those local authority services. And we're trying to understand the different delivery models to make sure that we can see, you know, best in show, really, and try and understand and, and, and share that around the, both local authorities and the rest of the sector. And we're also tracking regularly local authority capacity. Uh, to make sure that we understand um, where there are blips and why there are blips so that we can help uh, uh, support that. Number three is enhancing and promoting standards and guidance and CIFA's uh, um, uh, uh, fingerprints are all over this one because we're looking really carefully uh, with them and with the rest of the sector about which standards and guidance um, uh, at the moment aren't fit for purpose and where we need new standards and guidance. So there's a CIFA review of the SNG and I think um, uh, Peter uh, mentioned it this morning. Um, we're also thinking about digital stuff. Now I've just picked on one, AI and um, uh, 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 remote sensing, could, we could throw all of those into the mix as well. But digital trench side recording, Thomas Cromwell's here and is going to be talking about that at the conference too. We've got multiple um, uh, organisations developing new systems of digital recording, there are no underpinning principles. Is that data going to be fair? What happens if you have three organisations digging contiguous sites? How do you mix it together? Those sorts of things. And a really interesting one, and, and Kenneth is here at the back, the standard measure for archaeological excavation. So Royal, the RICS, the Royal Institute of uh, Chartered Surveyors, have a standard measure for most things to do with construction. They do not have one for archaeology, but archaeological attendance is part of that book. And we think that there is an opportunity there. Uh, it doesn't sound like much, and it also sounds slightly frightening, you know, to build it all down into consistency. Uh, you know, this is how you dig a waterfront. It takes two people, uh, uh, half a day to dig half a metre, uh, half a cubic metre. That's not what we're about. What we're trying to do is to, is to take the price even more out of the equation so that the quality can shine through on the, the contract. So if a standard measure is a standard measure that everybody agrees with, then if we find more on a certain site, we know how to change the, the contractual arrangements. Something that Mike Heaton has written about in um, CIFA magazines going back 10 years, is it? Something like that. Anyway, we're doing it. We're going to try it. It may not work, but if it does, it could be a game changer. What it could do is provide the basis for a new way of calculating sensible profit in organisations. And if you have sensible profit, you can begin to build sensible training and you can support your staff. So fingers crossed on that one. Goal four, turning data into knowledge. The big thing about where everybody is engaged in, in creating knowledge, why they love archaeology. But it's also about where does that information go? And I think Penn mentioned, you know, a very narrow group of people. We're, go we're going to do, uh, as well as the Heritage Information Access Strategy, which is uh, to try to link together all 85 HERs and to be able to produce a national data set that everybody can get access to, um, networks and tools for synthesis, uh, research hubs, regional or, or communities of interest, um, different uh, toolkits, fair data and consistency, and, and uh, Rob mentioned the importance of the digital revolution. All of these things we think will provide additional spice and excitement. And we're doing um, the public user needs survey again, specifically 20 years on nearly, to understand how people do consume archaeological information. 
And we think that there are, you know, through social media and other platforms, the way that people want to access that has changed beyond all recognition. So should we be producing new kinds of product? Again, Rob mentioned that. And goal five, the one that keeps me awake at night, the archives. Uh, where do we put the stuff that needs keeping? What do we keep? Why do we keep it? For whom? How long? Um, the Future for Archaeological Archives programme, which I'm also the SRO for, is a subset of that. And what we're trying to do, some of you will have seen some stuff in the, in the media about this, we're trying to think through whether we can get a national centre which will give us 100 years of space nationally for archives, uh, co-located perhaps with the Science Museum Group's uh, national collections at Rawton and Swindon, but linked to local museums so that they can get access to their stuff for their exhibitions and displays. So it's not really a provocation, but it's more a statement to say, I, my ears have been wide open listening to the other provocations to think how can we drop those pieces of thought, those gems that are coming out from you into that programme so that over the coming years, what you do and how you do it, you come back and say, uh, actually, it did change and it was for the better. Thank you.